Welcome to chapter 12 of the Surface Marketing Text. And this is the chapter that talks about the role of the customer in service delivery. So this is a, a challenging area from services perspective because we face an ethical and practical consideration. The customer has come to our service, is paying us money, and we are expecting them to perform the role of partial employee and to perform specific roles to get the most out of their customer experience. Now, this is one of the ultimate challenges of services marketing, convincing someone who has had to put in half of the effort that they have, in fact, received all of the reward and it was worth more of the money than they actually spent. So this chapter, it's a shorter slide deck for this uh, episode. What we're looking at is the importance of the customer role, what these roles tend to be, a um, bit of a brief discussion about self-service technology, but I've emphasized for the sheer meta enjoyment of it that you read the textbook. So it's the self-service technology section I'll get you to read the textbook. Welcome to participating in your own customer experience. Now, overall, the thing about customers' role in service delivery is that we need to enhance how the customer interacts. And we need to understand how the customer interacts with our service so that we can get the most out of the service encounter from the company's point of view and a satisfied customer who's gotten the best out of their service is a customer who we've, at the very least, met the zone of tolerance. But most likely, if the customer feels that they are in control, they are in command, and they are getting good value and great benefit from the service, they'll likely become loyal customers. And because they know what to do inside the service environment, they become valuable customers because as they get better at self-provisioning their service, they cost a little bit less and they tend to spend a little bit more. So the trouble we have is at the outset where we have customers who widen the service performance gap because they don't know what to do. And a couple of things that are on the screen at the moment are probably key indicative points. Top of the list is a customer doesn't know that they have a role to play, or even if they know that they have a role, they don't know what that role looks like. And the challenge here is that in our advertising and our communications, we can demonstrate and display ideal behaviors, but until the customer is actually in the service, then we don't really know how well that education or how well that training of the customer took place. Compounding that is that a customer who doesn't quite know what they're doing or a customer who is misusing the service or a customer who's doing it wrong can interfere with the experience of the other customers. Now, as we know from service scapes, the interaction between customers is a key part. And we know that some of the approach avoidance behavior comes from looking at other customers and deciding if based on the other people at the service, do you match the clientele, whether you match the service, whether you think you match the service or not, do you match the other customers, would you feel comfortable amongst those customers? We also have the problem in the service performance camp where we bring in the wrong customer, the self-service customer who likes control, customization and modifications, who comes into a preset, predetermined, heavily scripted service, is going to have a bad customer service experience. Now, objectively, on a heavily scripted preset service, your experience that you're providing as a services marketer can be hitting all of your guidelines, all of your internal criteria, and if you've got the wrong market segment, there's a service performance gap. Lastly, one of the things that you need to ensure is that within your service design, if the customer performs the role well, they should be unlocking more benefits. So if you come to a service 
which requires co-production, co-creation, and requires you to perform a role, and you don't perform that role, you should get a less adequate or less satisfactory performance from someone who does perform the role. So if you go along to a hairdresser, close your eyes and say, surprise me, or if you don't even say, surprise me, if the hairdresser asks you, well, what would you like, and you just basically non-committal shrugs and grunts, you should get a worse haircut than someone who comes in and says, well, this is what I'd like to have happen. So you've got to have some interactive element where, and if you think here about the services triangle, the interaction between customer, between provider and customer, comes through in this point. If the customer knows their role, performs their role, and is willing and able to perform their role, there should be a reward, there should be better performance and better outcomes for them from doing the right thing. So, the fellow customer, the selling customers to each other. This is one of the things that if you get into sports marketing, you realize really quickly how strange it is as a business. That it's not just selling 30, like the rugby league. Go to Canberra Stadium, go to Bruce Stadium, go watch the Canberra Raiders play a home game. You're not just selling the skills of the 15 Raiders who are on the field, plus the other, their opponents. So you're not just selling the skills of 30 professionals. You're selling the skills of the crowd. You're selling each other. The ticket buyer is going to contribute to the overall experience of those around them. So if they know when to cheer, when to boo, when to heckle, when to stay silent, when to what the social norms are, the traditional quiet for the kick. So when the opposition's kicker is taking a shot at goal, whether uh, you have a cultural norm of silence and noise, what the different arrangements are. Because you're selling the experience of being with a group of others. So from a negative point of view, the other customers in the experience can be disruptive. They can have incompatible needs. For example, if you are on a long distance flight and your desire is to make use of that 20 hours of uptime in the air away from the rest of the world for a quiet bit of slip, uh, sleep and the person in the seat next to you wants to make use of that 20 hours uptime to finish their novel, either one they're reading or they're writing, you want darkness, they want light. Basic incompatible needs. Now, the first airline that can actually segment the seat arrangements by intended behavior, so you get on the flights, you go to check in, and they say, this is a four-hour flight, so you're flying to Melbourne. This, will, this flight will be five and a half hours, you're going to Perth. Would you be preferring to sleep, to watch a movie, work on a laptop, uh, read a book, whatever your choices are, you rank them, either rank them or pick your priority, and then they distribute all those who want to be working on laptops are distributed to one point on the aircraft, those desiring sleep are distributed to another point. So you have this, you know, you could do streaming, you could do segmentation streaming. The other thing in the customer satisfaction is that when we talk about things such as equity, equity, perceived fairness, and service quality, service recovery. One of the things that we look at in here is that if you can see another customer getting an experience that looks like yours, then complaining and getting a superior experience, you may not actually have previously had a complaint, but you want what they have. So you'll complain, even though there was nothing wrong with your, up until that moment, you felt there was nothing wrong with your experience. You've just seen someone get something and you want a bit of that. So you've got to watch for these elements when you're looking at how the customers interact, that there can be the negative side. On the positive side, customer being in a crowd, other people having a vibe to, uh, having an atmosphere to a place.
The socialization friendships, I mean, it's one of the things that we sell at the universities when we are selling postgraduate education. One of the things we talk about is the networking that you will undertake in your classes. In the customer socialization aspect, you know, for a master's degree, one of the things we talk about is the creation of those networks, the peers, your friends you meet in the classroom, your friends you meet at university. When we talk about the alumni network and we talk about the friendships and the networks, we are talking about selling customers to customers. We're talking about selling you to other students and other students to you. So socialization and friendships are an important facet of other customers. And lastly, the customer roles, the idea of the experienced customer who is the teacher or the mentor of the new customer. You go to a gym, you've been working at a gym for a while, you see someone new coming to the gym, they're looking lost, you ask them if they need some help, because you know you'll get a better experience if they know what they're doing, and they are more comfortable, you'll feel more comfortable. So these are also things where you start to get the brand loyal, where you have communities uh, around brands and around product consumption that customers take other co experienced customers, start socializing newer customers into the traditions. It's how you end up with uh, soccer stadiums all knowing the words to the same song or all knowing when to sing that song because there are lead customers who have been teaching, playing mentoring roles and supportive roles to train other customers. Particularly if you ever go to a live show, this is one of those places where live football, uh, in my case, the live wrestling, where as one of the people who had been quite senior, I've been going to quite a lot of these shows, I knew when things would take place, and I knew when to, when other members of the crowd didn't know what was about to happen next, and needed a little forewarning, or in one particular case, needed to be moved about two foot away from a very large person landing on them, so my role as a customer was to enhance their customer experience by getting them to just far enough away from where the problem would be. Now the other elements in this, when we think of, when we talk of customers as partial employees, remembering that customers co-create. So you want to be thinking about this from the point of view of if the customer comes to the service partially prepared, if they've done their background, if they've done their background briefing, they've, you know, if there's a manual they need to read, if there's they're coming to see a they're coming to see a football match, have do they know who the teams are? Do they know what's going on? Are they familiar with all of the different uh, strategies, the nuances of the game? How much background briefing and preparation do they need to do? Or if they're looking at something like coming to a hair salon or going to a massage or going to a doctor's. If you think about physiotherapy, you go to a physiotherapist for an hour, then they send you away with exercises. They give you homework to make you a partial employee. And the success of your outcome is determined by the extent to which you work on your own time, on your own recovery. So there, the inputs can modify and alter the success of the productivity. The question you want to ask yourself in terms of service design and product design is, does the role of the customer need to be widened, enhanced, or expanded, or should it be reduced? Are there aspects that we expect the customer to do that's not actually the customer's job, or the customers aren't doing terribly well that we could do better? Now, this part, when it comes to looking at the service gap model, the zone of tolerance is also a hugely personally driven element where the customer can contribute to service quality and to their own satisfaction. By engaging, by raising their involvement, by taking responsibility for satisfaction. You go to a movie, you go to the movie with the intent to enjoy it, you have a better chance of getting satisfaction out of it than if you go along there for the express purpose of 
deliberately wanting to tear this thing apart and have a bad time. Similarly, whilst you're at a service and it's a human interaction service, asking questions, clarifying, finding out, am I doing this right? Is this what I want to have happen? When things go wrong or things break, raising it, highlighting it, but also taking ownership and working around. It's like, okay, that went wrong. Can I, as a customer, fix it? Can I, as a customer, modify my expectations whilst the uh, the problem is being resolved? The flip side to creating customer as co-employee is customers can become competitors. And this is where self-service gets to be a bit problematic in the sense of the ultimate competitor to takeaway and home delivery is self-cooking. The restaurant going out to dinner experience versus the dine at home, hold a dinner party with friends. The invite someone over for dinner versus go out for dinner. Each of these elements, each of these component parts, where the customer has the skills and the ability to actually compete against the service being provided. So the first and foremost is that you have a null position. You have the competition of, I don't need the service versus the service. The, you then have the competition of, I can do this myself against the service. And we also have these elements, again, there's the detail on the screen, and I'm gonna push you back to the textbook to look at this. But I just wanna highlight trust and psychic rewards. In fact, trust and control are quite heavily linked, so I should deal the two together. Sometimes the customer will self-provide because they want the control. I will cook for myself because I have dietary requirements, therefore I will know that I can trust my own food because I know the ingredients that went into it. I know how I have control over my own food so I can trust that what I serve to myself meets my requirements. At the same time, there is also the intrinsic psychic reward of my own display of skill, even if it's just to myself, and the reward of self-creation. So there's a whole market segment of people for whom services are the antithesis of their needs and wants. That to get someone to perform a service on your car is to admit defeat, or rather to lose the opportunity of the reward of self-maintenance and self, uh, both self-control, I am able to perform this task and I like doing this. I mean, one of the reasons that you cook for yourself is that you enjoy cooking. Therefore, you are gaining psychic reward. And that makes you, though, a competitor to a service that would offer a similar product or similar service. Now the key here is it's not offering a similar reward. So if you know that you have a market segment of people who self-cater and cook for themselves, and that the intrinsic psychic reward of self-cooking is a very strong facet of what motivates them, then you can offer a service such as the Korean barbecue where you are presented with a hot plate and the opportunity not to have to do the washing up at the end and all the intrinsic psychic rewards of self-preparation, self-cooking, and all the control mechanisms of the self-cooking. You're not selling the food, you're selling the cooking behavior. And this means that you need to understand what are the core, actual, and augmented components of your product, and what are the core and actual elements that someone is seeking in terms of a service behavior that they could solve by their own cons by being their own service provider as a customer or they could solve by coming to you as your customer so it's one of these ones that you, it gets you to step back and say what is it that we offer that if a customer is engaging as a partial employee what is it that they're seeking? All right, so the customer participation elements, we're gonna briefly talk about these three uh, 
or three of these elements, really the important ones to find the customer's role. And that's from your own organizational side as well. Recruit, educate, and train customers and reward them. And then the customer mix. Make certain that your segments match up. Now your segment element I'm going to leave out in the discussion. I'm going to push back to the text because you're also thinking about market segmentation. You're thinking about core values. You're thinking about what is the product offering? What is the core value? What is the market segment that will be attracted to those core values? Let's talk about the customer's role here. What do we want the customer to do? Well, there are three possible avenues that we can consider here. The first one is that the customer comes to the service production to assist themselves. Their performance in the service role is about guiding the quality, nature, and design of the service to suit their own needs. Most services have this component part. Through co-production, you help improve your own lots, your own success, and your own odds of success in a service delivery. But we can also have the role of helping others, where you can be recognized as a more senior, whether you get you know, on a forum, you get a, an icon or a little star or a little acknowledgement of a rank or a title, or whether you are recognized by others as a knowledgeable uh, you're a customer, but you're a knowledgeable customer and people defer to you for your expertise. The third area is that brand community, developing brands and going out and promoting the company because the company recognizes that the customer is credible, authoritative, and the customer recognizes that the success of the company will provide benefit to them both in continuing to offer the product they really like, and as they get to be known as you know, the partial employee or the brand advocate, it ties into, it's beneficial to them as well for their reputation. They become the person who's you know, seen as a helpful member of the brand community. So to do this, you are looking at recruitment, education, and reward. Segmentation is obviously key here. When you are recruiting within your segment, you are looking for market mavens, you are looking for early adopters, You're not looking for early majority. The early adopters are opinion leaders. The innovators are too far removed. The innovators are basically a bit flighty, but the early adopter is thinking, how do I make myself stand out from the others? And if you recruit an early adopter, they also have a strong word of mouth propensity and they are seen by their peers and by others in their community as someone whose opinion is valued. So they become the kind of customer who can educate other customers and other customers will seek them out for their advice. In terms of training customers, this is also about ensuring that if you see someone being helpful and doing the right thing, that you acknowledge it. If you see someone doing the wrong thing, that you intercept it. And rewarding customers for contributions. It doesn't need to always be financial. The psychic rewards, the thank you, the acknowledgement of this is our customer. They're really knowledgeable in this area. You never say it as they know more about this than I do. They say, look, they've had some great experiences with their products they do know, and they're probably going to be able to help you because the sort of questions that you want to know in terms of the experience, they're going to be our answer. So you're really framing it around their expertise comes from being a customer. Our expertise comes from being the service provider, and together we create a more valuable opportunity for you to ask questions, learn more about the service. All right, the compatibility management, we talked about this a little bit uh, in segmentation. We'll also talk about this in demand management. But one of the things you're looking for is you want crowds of customers that are loosely compatible. You don't need perfect isolation, but you do need to avoid significant clashes. 
For example, cinemas that run the uh, movie sessions that are highlighted, yes, this is a session where there may be babies and the babies may be crying. That is a way to say, if you choose to go in here, you know what's going to happen. But also, if you are electing to, uh, if you have a small child, you're worried about whether the child's going to disturb others in an audience, here is an opportunity for you to go with like-minded. Uh, and also then, you've got a small group of people who have a shared common bound of they're all with children. So suddenly you create a, a homogenous group, which then, because these people are similar to each other, could be a case of then selling other customers. So if you think about this from the perspective of you're managing your compatibility because you're also mindful of the importance of the other customer. So if you know that you've got a cohort of customers with young children and, you're wor and you know that they are worried that maybe the children would be disruptive of other customers and you run child-friendly sessions, you're activating mere presence. You're, not, you're no longer the one standing apart from the others. You have got a crowd of children. Secondly, socialization and friendships amongst children, amongst parents. Thirdly, you've suddenly got this community, an Insta community of a shared bond of we all have kids. So the, we all have kids, we all like this service, we all, you know, if this is a first child versus someone's on the who has a second child, the parent with the older children might be able to be a mentor to the parents with the younger children. There's all sorts of opportunities that you can create by looking for a certain level of compatibility management in how you set up your service. So the final thing that I want you to look at, now obviously I always ask you to look at the whole of the textbook chapter, but I want you to give consideration to table 12.2 and I want you to look at this from the point of product design and service design of the characteristics of a service that will modify the importance of the compatibility and then think how do I capitalize? How do I make use of this as a product feature? How do I turn this into a strength? Now, quite often as a marketer, you'll need to turn, you'll need to defend against this being a weakness. For example, airplane flights, everyone's in close proximity, everyone, it's crowded, therefore you start running into a lot more, it feels like a lot more of a random allocation as well in terms of who's where. But the customers in close physical proximity how do you turn it into a feature? How do you make the fact that you are going to be closer to other people something that you address as part of a product design? So look at these component parts and think about it from the how do we sell it as a, an established and key part of our service offering. Now as always, if you need me, if there's any clarifications or queries you have, at Stephen Dan or Stephen.Dan at anu.edu. The customer roles is one where there's also the ethics consideration. So within the text, what you need to be considering is that the more you ask of a customer, the more you have to ask the question of, should we be charging them a lower price because we're expecting them to participate? Or should we be charging them a higher price because it's a lot more customized? Are we charging and where are we providing the value? Are we providing the value in terms of access to the facility? Or are we providing value in terms of our people using their skills to deliver the service to that audience? So it's something to think about as you're putting this together. It's not as clean cut, particularly when we're looking at encouraging or enhancing customer role in product delivery. It's not as clear cut as it is when we come over to something like physical goods where we can put on the side of the label some assembly required or we can put on the side do it yourself. Services tends to always be some assembly required 
And whether it's a premium or it's a bug, when it's do-it-yourself is how you pitch the service to the market.